The topic for this seminar is on core creativity and mindfulness. And I recently wrote a book called Core Creativity, The Mindful Way to Unlock Your Creative Self. So we're going to take a deeper dive into this subject of what creativity is, what are some of the distinctions between surface level creativity, core creativity, and how to access creativity from your creative unconscious. And like most people, whatever your vocation is, like all people, um, you're an artist and your masterpiece is your own life. In the late great uh, poet, singer, songwriter, Leonard Cohen, he had a great line that he gave me for one of my first books. And it's called, you lose your grip and then you slip into the masterpiece. So we want to lose our grip as creatives and we want to go outside of what traditionally has been called certain mindsets, certain rigid ways of thinking and being about creativity. And you might even think of yourself as being creative or not being creative, but there's always so much more that we can learn from highly creative people and the very unique processes that they've turned to, to turn up the volume of their creativity. And after 46 years of working here in Los Angeles as a creativity consultant and a meditation teacher to the television, uh, the film, music business, and in the last decade or two, the uh, dot-com and uh, computer business, I've really had a very unique and special opportunity to sit with creatives and actually go into recording studios, watch how they um, record an album from the very beginning to the very end, how in the middle of creating an album that they decide to throw away some songs that they thought that they were going to have as finished products and how they sit there and they go into a state of what I call absorbing mind where they just simply wait. And sometimes they're just playing on their guitar and the drummer's drumming a little bit and the pianist is going up and down the keys until they access something deep within their creative unconscious that wasn't there. And then they start to trust it and they give more and more room for it to unfold or for it to be uh, birthed or, bo or born. And that's what I call turning up the volume of your own creativity. So many of us are looking for a much desired personal transformation, particularly post COVID, where we've had a lot of quiet, Many of us spent, as I did, pretty much two years not teaching, not traveling, um, just seeing uh, clients on Zoom and having a lot of creative time on my hands. And so what did I do? I wrote a book on cool creativity um, because I started to listen and to get quiet and to tune in and to go inside and to listen to that very sacred space, or what I call the inner silent reverie of one's creative unconscious. Sometimes there's a, a loss for deaths. Some of us have lost people through COVID, and uh, some of us have lost very dear friends and colleagues uh, as a result of cancer or heart attacks or strokes. And creativity is something that from loss, we can really generate and we can rebirth and we can bring newness after there's been death or loss. Ideas help us navigate this time of transition. 
And it also helps us to create new visions. So let's go through just a little bit some of the various um, distinctions in what I mean by creativity. So on the beginning level of creativity, and most of us create from that beginning level, it involves reassembling what already exists. So for example, when I was writing my book, I looked back at all the, of my research notes and all of the companies that I had consulted to and all of the individual clients that I consulted to. And I gathered up uh, a lot of articles, even books that I'd read in the 70s about what is creativity, like Abraham Maslow's book on creativity. So at the beginning level of bringing creation to the creative process, we start first with entering the realm of reassembling, gathering, uh, harnessing. And sometimes it involves putting together aspects of other people's ideas or images, uh, pictures, colors that we've seen before, and just beginning to create a new fabric. Then second, it involves perceiving things differently. So what do I mean by that? Well, fixed, it, we, we all hold very fixed and rigid, what I call mindsets, particular kind of paradigms of ways that we want to view the world in ways that we view ourselves in terms of the creative process. As I've interviewed creatives, the number one most seminal theme, thread or fabric, was that all creatives have an abiding internal trust in themselves. So what do I mean by that? Well, they really trust that their creative unconscious is a wellspring. It's like this divine God that's always giving if you take the time to listen. Most people that I interviewed who are not in the creative arts oftentimes look at themselves and negatively have a negative mindset that I'm not a creative. If I'm an accountant or I'm a surgeon or I'm a psychologist, well, I'm, I'm not creative. What I do with people is I help them to transition from that faulty, negative default mode mindset that they view themselves as a non-creative person to beginning to embrace that everybody has a very special and a very sacred seminal core. And all that we need to really do is to assist them to tap into that sacred and seminal core. And so how do you switch somebody who's viewed themselves as not creative for their entire life out of that negative default mode? Well, first you have to identify what the hindrance is. What is their resistance? What is their avoidance? What is their objection? To beginning to embrace an entirely new mindset, a mindset where I can be creative and I am creative at everything that I do in each and every day. And as we say in Zen, to become non-wooden means to take the wood or the stiffness and the rigidity of each and every moment of our everyday mind and to throw it on the fire. I had a professor 
at Smith College in Buddhist Studies, the late Teresina Havens, Dr. Teresina Havens. And she had um, a favorite uh, phrase. And sometimes we would have seminars uh, out at my farmhouse in Hadley, Massachusetts, outside of Amherst. And we would have these little mini bonfires uh, as the ending of a class. And she had a favorite phrase, which directly addressed uh, getting rid of the negative mindsets. And that was, I offer the stage manager, which is the log of fixed rigidity to the fire. And I call in and harness the God of Shiva, both the destroyer and the creator, to toss the default mode, to toss the woodenness that we often have inside of ourselves so that we can embrace from the ashes always arises something new. And for many years as a, a young boy in Massachusetts, I worked at a flower a gardening farm in the afternoons and all day Saturday. And the farmers there who were my bosses used to do two very unusual things. You know, one of course was to take everybody's garbage in the neighborhood and put it into this bin. And over the course of one, two years, it would all turn into this rich mulch. And the other thing was to go around to funeral homes and gather up ashes of people that had been cremated and to put those also around the flowers and the fruit trees and the lemon trees uh, in the farm as a very rich mulch. So it's a wonderful metaphor, which I'll get into um, a little uh, further, is that creatives spend a lot of time adding mulch to sitting in silence and awaiting to receive. They realize that you have to mulch your own creative self. It also involves perceiving things differently and as well as inventing and navigating uh, the new. So what do I mean by core creativity? Well, core creativity is creativity that comes from the very center, very core of our being. Some people in certain spiritual traditions comfortably like to refer to the core of our being as our soul. In the Upanishads, a Hindu tradition, we refer to it as essence. In the Zen tradition, we refer to it as the nature of our being. And in the Zen and the mindfulness tradition, we oftentimes say, we need to fertilize and mulch in water the nature of our being in order to bring forth our true original nature. And so as creatives, we want to constantly be sitting quietly and mining down into our original nature, which is always dynamically connected to source. And creatives, which is another thing that I discovered in my clinical work of 46 years, is in addition to trusting their creative unconscious, and creatives also trust the importance of fertilizing the creative unconscious and spending time to mine down into the creative unconscious. So what's the process of, of achieving core creativity? Well, it, in my book, I created three stages that come from uh, decades of working with creatives. So the three stages that I discovered are absorbing mind, open mind, and activating mind. 
And we oftentimes move through these different phases or stages in a stage-oriented manner, while other times we are very fluid and we can go from absorbing mind into actually doing something to activating mind or coming back and spending time hanging out and embracing open-minded consciousness. You will know when to meditate, when to dabble or noodle, or when to sit in a state of quiet receptivity, when to listen to your instincts. And also another thing that many, many creatives I interviewed discovered was the function of play. And so, of course, as adults, we oftentimes say, well, play is just things that little children do. Well, when musicians, as I said, are stuck and they don't like particular songs that they already thought that they were gonna lay down tracks on in the creation of an album, what they do is they enter the magical child's state of play and they begin to just start playing one or more instruments. There's one musician that I, I've worked with for decades and he goes into his um, recording studio adjacent to uh, his home. And he'll sit quietly in what I call meditate uh, in mindfulness. He calls it just being in the flow. And because he's a multi-talented uh, uh, musician, multi-instrumentalist, sometimes he'll pick up the guitar and he'll start playing chords or um, playing in the key of C or the key of D or key of F. And other times he'll go on to the drums and he'll just start uh, banging away at a cymbal and doing some uh, drum beats. And other days he'll sit at the uh, piano and start playing up and down the, the keyboard. And that usually this, what he calls musical play, it starts to um, mine into the well of creativity. So we can move in and out from one stage to another. We can also move from here to an intuitive understanding that in the state of quiet, we're taking in and we're, we're receiving what was hidden because we were primarily focused on the external world. And most core creativity comes from this deeper hidden state of the creative unconscious. You don't necessarily have to completely be still to enter into the mind state of receptivity. Of course, it's what we desire, which is the first state is absorbing mind. And absorbing mind means to slow down and to wait. And then to wait in order to listen. And to listen in order to hear. And to hear in order to create. And to see in order to feel and to feel in order to gather up sensations in a somatic sense of physical self, as well as to gather up energies that might be coming from our electromagnetic field and from that collective state of our core creativity. And the late Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung called it the field of the collective unconscious, that not only did we have an individual unconscious, where our own dreams come from, and, um, that we oftentimes listen to when we wake up in the morning, and our intuition oftentimes comes from this individual intuitive unconscious. But Carl Jung, through his 
vast years of studies of cross-cultural systems, of world religions, cross-cultural um, cultures, like for example, he found that there were these commonalities in myths and dreams, symbols and archetypes that Aborigines oftentimes had very similar symbols in their dreams as people in Switzerland or the United States. And so it's very important that we listen and we mine also into our dreams that activate a personal unconscious, which then he said opens the doors and oftentimes the floodgates very, very wide to our collective creative unconscious. So in absorbing mind, when we get quiet, and as I said, to listen and to hear, to receive. And sometimes in absorbing mind, it can also involve, instead of not doing something, it can involve us actively exploring various forms of stimulation. For example, visiting museums, for taking in art, sitting with a painting for many, many hours. I have visited the Sistine Chapel in Rome many, many times. And I discovered in my very first visit that you were allowed to lay down at that point in history, I don't know what it is today, on the long uh, pews or benches and to look up if you chose to at the Sistine Chapel and to see the brilliance of the work of Michelangelo. And it was there the very first time that I coined the phrase absorbing mind and then open mind. Because after an hour, an hour and a half of my laying there, and truly absorbing, taking in the brilliance of uh, Michelangelo's work, I started to experience my own creative unconscious just opening up and allowing me to enter into spaces and internal places I'd never been. In addition to sitting and looking uh, at, at a painting, for example, um, the late painter, the modern artist, um, Pollock, Jackson Pollock, he used to sit in his Long Island uh, studio out in the Hamptons in front of these huge, gigantic blank canvases. And his wife said, sometimes he would sit there for days and weeks, just meditating on the canvas. And his friends, as well as her, they would be worried, was he having some sort of psychotic episode? Or, um, had he become so withdrawn or despondent? And he would oftentimes joke with them and say, no, I, I'm busy at work. What he was doing is he was in absorbing mind and he was creating the entire painting on the blank canvas, spot by spot, in advance of activating mind and in advance of any sort of activity. He was seeing every little dot of color in advance. And then he would see the, the entire painting in advance. Another way that we can uh, take action to explore uh, absorbing mind is if you're at a play, uh, is studying and observing the, uh, how the actors interact with each other on stage and how the actors interact with the audience, which is also a very important dynamic, both with actors, but also with musicians, really terrific musicians. They are constantly going back and forth and picking up on the energy of the audience and then building upon that. Bruce Springsteen once said that what you're doing as a rock and roller is you're 
pulling the audience and you're pulling the music forward and you're creating new genres in that you're by pulling your audience forward, you're also in your own thinking, taking yourself from where you've been and where you are in inventing and creating a new future of sound and of lyrics. I personally, in absorbing mine, also use notes. I travel around with my electronic uh, gadgets all the time and I'm speaking notes into them. Uh, sometimes I have a small little uh, notebook. And I'm always writing, drawing, configuring, because I capture certain ideas that I want to write about or I might want to lecture about later. Sometimes I sit around and for an entire weekend, I'll just cut out photos from magazines and I'll make a collage. And then I'll meditate on the collage. And next thing I know, on Monday morning, I'm starting to write extemporaneously. And it's all come from just the gathering of photos and piecing and putting them together, activate something within my creative unconscious so that then I'm able to bring forth something new, something fresh, something uh, original. Sometimes I tell people when they have creative blocks to go on the internet and for example, to put up, pull up this many, many uh, websites, but just throw out Pinterest uh, for a moment. And Pinterest is a website that has thousands and thousands of photos and architectural designs of homes and um, sculptures and paintings. And um, it's just endless. It's an endless resource to uh, wet the, the palette of your desire to be uh, creative. And it will also allow you to enter into a re receptive state of open mind. Another thing that I suggest, particularly to me, musicians, but I also just suggest it to everyone who wants to be more creative, is to listen to music and perhaps songs that you love. For example, I love Simon and Garfunkel's music, dating all the way back to when I was a teenager in Boston. And I lay on the couch in my best friend's home and we were down in the cellar and we would uh, turn the lights down low, each sitting in a different place. And we would turn on the sounds of silence or Scarborough Fear Chemical. And at that time I discovered but the first few weeks of listening to their music, I would just hear the music. And then one night I decided that I would start to listen to just the lyrics alone. And as I was listening to the lyrics, I would forget about the rhythm or the melodies. And then on another night, I would just listen to the guitar parts and then the drum parts and the piano parts. And in my research, I found out later, and I actually visited uh, Mozart's home in, uh, outside of uh, Vienna in Salzburg, Austria, that Mozart, when he was creating his various symphonies, he would hear the entire symphony. It would just kind of download into him. And he would write it out. And then when he would go into further refinements, he would simultaneously, while he was listening to the entire symphony in his creative unconscious, he would just hear the string section and he'd furiously write those parts out. Then he would hear the drum section and he would furiously write that part out and on and on and on. So that there's something that's very essential when you, you leave the mindset that we just listen to music and we like it just because we like it, to that we can actually listen with what Theodore Wright called listening 
with the third ear, meaning that we have a normal two ears, but there's this third ear, there's this divine or etheric quality, consciousness, that all forms of meditation provide you access with. And the one that I enjoy the most is mindfulness meditation. And I'm going to take us on a, um, a little guide uh, and a little journey uh, of that fairly soon. What do you notice if you're listening to a song uh, in a compartmentalized way? What do you hear that you never heard before? What do you discover? Not only about the lyrics of the song, what do you discover about what was, might have been going on in the songwriters or the musicians' creative unconscious when you listen with that third ear? And you might also discover that there's parts of a song or parts of a painting that you love that you've looked at or listened to for years and years and years, that you've missed, that you actually never heard that rhythm, or, or you never fully embraced those lyrics. If it's a painting, I always suggest that people, when they go to art museums, first do a, a first scan and then to stand up, sit quietly, and look with fresh eyes, as if you were putting on an entire new set of lenses. And Otto Huxley referred to that as seeing through the mystical eyes, seeing or observing what Adam and Eve most likely experienced at the first moment of creation in the Garden of Eden. So another thing about absorbing mind that's really important is that your intuition is always uh, at full power. So you can remain open to stimulation and ideas rather than just outrightly rejecting them. In my new book, I tell a funny story where there was a gentleman and he'd been referred to me by his uh, psychoanalyst from New York City. And he called me and said, I'm really stuck. Um, and my Anne Lizanne um, spends a month at a time in Los Angeles. And I'd like to send them to you because I know that you have some unorthodox California uh, techniques and methods. And um, he describes himself as a very uncreative individual. And he's, he's really stuck in his life. So I arranged to see him uh, at my home office here, which is up in the Santa Monica Mountains outside of Los Angeles. And it's a Zen home, and, uh, it's walled in, uh, has a feeling of a Zen temple because that's the way I created and built it. Um, there are Zen meditation gardens, Buddhas, surrounded by beautiful uh, trees and plants and uh, cactuses. And so this uh, entrepreneur, he came and he was fully dressed in a three-piece suit. He had a proper hat, he had a, um, a, an umbrella and a leather briefcase. He came in and sat down on my couch and he was holding his briefcase on top of his lap holding onto the umbrella and I could see it was obviously very uncomfortable. And so I asked him, I said, um, I bet you've never been to an office to see a, a psychotherapist, a psychoanalyst like this one. And he says, no, I'm just terrified. So he said, I feel like I should just write your check out and give it to you right now and leave. So I made him feel very comfortable and told him, have you ever taken your shoes off at your psychoanalyst office in New York City when you lay on the couch? And he looked at me and he laughed. He said, you've got to be kidding. Huh? 
Dr. Accurate, I would never do that in his presence. I said, well, how would it feel if you took your shoes off? And he did. And then he loosened his tie. So I knew we we're already uh, dynamic rapport. So I said to him, without uh, any further ado, I said, would, would you be willing to try something very California? And he said, okay. I said, let's just close our eyes and sit quietly before we discuss why you're here and what it is you want. So we sat and I'm thinking, I don't know where this is gonna go. Um, I hope this guy uh, doesn't think I'm some sort of a California nut therapist. And about 10 minutes into the sitting, he started crying and sobbing and weeping. And he moved the briefcase off his lap and let the uh, umbrella fall to the floor. And I tuned in to my unconscious and I saw a lake and a rainstorm. And I said, can you tell me what's happening for you? And is this around the age of 15? And he started sobbing even more so. And he described that he had been in a, a terrible boating accident where him and his uh, two chums had gone out to a lake and a storm came up. It was a perfectly sunny day, uh, somewhere in Michigan or Minnesota. And a terrible rainstorm came up and capsized their small uh, boat. And that the third uh, friend, his chum as he called him, had slipped uh, away from the boat because they were developing hypothermia and he drowned. And some huge waves came up and took the sailboat with the two boys, remaining two boys, into the shore. And so um, the police were summoned and his parents took him, uh, went down to the police station. And when they were driving home, they said, you're never to discuss this ever, ever again, ever. And he had sealed that memory. And he was having uh, great difficulty in his marriage at the time. And he was married to a wonderful woman, five children. And he was having an affair. And he said, oh my God, I, I realize that I have been punishing myself and hurting and harming myself all these years over this terrible survivor's guilt. And that I've never been able to be who I am. And then he opened his eyes and he took his tie off and he unbuttoned his shirt a little bit more. And uh, we were off and running uh, in a long and uh, wonderful creative therapeutic relationship that grew out of trusting the intuition to just take some time to be quiet and to let what was in his unconscious surface up and bubble up, which is what I did with him. When we do that, we oftentimes we can bypass the limited thinking and the biases of our rational mind, leading to breakthroughs and intuitive insights that we never really knew were there. I've oftentimes uh, experienced a sense of spaciousness, things that I was anxious about, um, perceptions that I was kind of chasing after, or ideas, just naturally flowing up in a very spacious uh, manner. Limited options fall away as we open up the spaciousness so that we can experience unlimited options. And you feel yourself open to receive core knowledge, new images, pictures, colors, music, words, ideas, and thought forms. So the last stage that I just want to cover in, in this talk today is open mind. And as I said, the beginning of my discovering the relationship of 
open mind to our creative process started at the Sistine Chapel uh, in Rome. In that same summer, uh, I was invited to uh, participate and sit in the family box of the rock band U2 at the Royal Dublin uh, Showgrounds in Dublin, Ireland. And uh, later that evening, uh, the guitarist uh, from U2, Edge, and his lovely wife invited me to sit at the Hilton Hotel and have drinks and to just talk in a personal, social way. And I had asked him about his creative process because in the background, I knew I was going to write a book someday. This was back in 1993. And I, I said, um, I noticed that the departure between the Joshua Tree album and um, the Aktung Baby album uh, it was just an, an enormous uh, change up. How did you arrive there as a band and as a, a musician? And he said, well, we all decided that after the Joshua Tree album, we would go and spend some time in Berlin so that we could kind of immerse ourselves in a much more gritty, uh, cloudy, rainy, uh, and deeply textured uh, historical uh, environment with lots of museums, lots of underground music clubs. And he said, but most importantly, I go into this state, and I don't know what to call it, where I was hearing the new music for weeks and months before we were actually uh, writing any of it. I was hearing the sounds and the rhythms. And I said, oh, I think that's open mind. That's the state that musicians and creatives and artists that we can all enter into and that historical figures from all time have entered into this dynamic and deeply rich and textured uh, state connected to our creative unconscious. When you enter open mind, your natural core creativity becomes available to you instantly. Uh, you don't even have to effort, but you do need to effort to either go out and seek stimulation or to sit very quietly. There's always some form of effort involved in that. And when you're sitting quietly, you can lose track of time, and space, and place, and you can feel deeply curious, because curiosity is one of the very first, uh, what I call, axis states. It's a state of relaxation and meditation. Some people in the Christian contemplative uh, tradition like to refer to to it as it's a state of prayer or contemplative prayer or contemplation as Thomas Merton uh, taught us. And from in this state of curiosity and contemplative inquiry can come novel, fresh, and deeply profound and original ideas. So I'd like us now uh, to move out of our heads for the next few minutes. And I'd like to guide you on one or two meditations that will help you to activate your own core creativity. So sit up comfortably. You might wanna take the palms of your hands and touch your first, your thumb and your first fingers. And this is what's called Gyan Mudra. And place them comfortably uh, either in your lap with the left hand on top of the right hand, or you can just turn them over and place them comfortably uh, on your thighs. The second aspect of this meditation for accessing open mind is the eye focus. And in the meditative in contemplative traditions, there's many, many places to focus your eyes uh, when you're meditating or praying. And as creatives, I think the two best places is one is to roll your eyes up 
and just let them gently rest at what's known as the third eye. I call it the visionary eye. For anyone who's ever had a lot of mind distraction or trauma, there's a better place for you. And that's to focus outside at nature, like a tree or a garden or the blue sky. If you don't have that available to you because you're in an apartment or you're uh, closed off, is to find an object or a picture or a particular kind of color that you can focus your attention on. The next component of the core creativity meditation is what do you become focused upon when you meditate? And so in this meditation, our focus is going to be on entering a state of receptivity. So what we will do is we will repeat that when you breathe in, and if you are used to, it's a yoga breath, but you breathe into your abdomen and lungs and you hold the breath for one, and then you empty your lungs, then you empty your abdomen. And on the in-breath, you mentally repeat, entering receptivity. And on the out-breath, you mentally repeat, deepening into core creativity. So that on the in-breath, you're breathing in, entering receptivity. And on the out-breath, deepening into core creativity. And the last aspect of the meditation is posture. I suggest if you can, if you, unless you're in a physical pain, and if you are, of course, lay down on the floor, you can hear me, you don't have to see me. Or if you're in bed or you're laying on a couch because you're in pain, again, uh, get as comfortable uh, as you are wherever you are. But for those of us who can sit up in a chair or sit up against the wall in a cross-legged position, or you can extend your legs straight out in front of you to get as comfortable as you can. People who like to sit cross-legged, I also suggest that they sit up against a straight wall so they can feel a lot of support. And if you're in a chair, of course, if you lean back, I'm experiencing right now a lot of wonderful support from the chair. So we're going to take a couple of minutes now. And we're going to go inside. And I'm going to guide you into this uh, meditation to activate core creativity. So for those of us that are going to look outside and focus on nature or on a color or a picture or a relaxing place if you're inside. And then those of us that want to go inside, we're gonna close our eyes now. And roll your eyes up and focus on the third eye, the mind's eye. Just re rest comfortably your eyes, the third eye. And then allow your tongue to drift up to the top, to the roof of your mouth, and just rest there. And as your eyes are focused in the mind's eye, your tongue is gently touching the roof of your mouth, find the in-breath. We're just going to, without the word focus yet, just pay attention to breathing so that your abdomen expands a little bit. And then the breath comes all the way up into the lungs. And then you empty the lungs as you're breathing out and you pull the abdomen in towards your spine like a balloon, and just continue that so that you're breathing in long, slow, and deep. And you're breathing out 
long, slow, and deep. Now we're going to add that as you're breathing in, you mentally repeat entering receptivity. And as you're breathing out, long, slow, and deep, deepening into core creativity. So as you hear the sound of my voice, I'm going to continue to guide you. And all you need to do is follow the rhythm of your breathing pattern, entering receptivity on the in-breath, and deepening core creativity on the out breath. Notice that as you're breathing and you're deepening, notice and pay particular attention the words of trust, that as we're entering receptivity, state of absorbing mind, trust what's flowing. Allow your conscious mind to go offline with chatter and noise and, and or to get very quiet and recede into the background of awareness. As the neurons in the prefrontal cortex in your parasympathetic nervous system come online, Bring online the neurons of core creativity arise from that deep, silent reverie from within. It doesn't matter if the thinking mind is present. Simply allow it to be and then detach from it. Take this opportunity to go more deeply to noticing, paying attention to what you're receiving. An open mind. You may be surprised, even delighted. something original or new, fresh, has emerged. And your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to just listen and record and to be present with what you're receiving from your unconscious mind. Now take a few more breaths in and out of your body. And if you experience that you're 
already inside of something, an open mind, just tell your unconscious, thank it, and either continue while the rest of us come back into ordinary waking consciousness, or everybody come back and after this talk is over, you might once again re immerse yourself in this open minded meditation. So, look around the room. You might want to stretch up, twist side to side, and just sit quietly for a few seconds. And let the conscious mind record anything that came out of your intuition, anything that um, was original, new. Don't discard anything. And when the talk is over, I would encourage you to write down in your mindfulness journal what you experienced. This is a meditation. Uh, it's one of many that I teach, and it's in the book called Creativity. That's a, a beginning meditation to help you to become relaxed and familiar with how to gain direct access into absorbing mind and open mind. Okay. I hope that was refreshing and relaxing, it was for me. Um, I would like encourage you to do a few more things uh, to stimulate open mind, and that's to record your dreams at night and to write them down. Um, the moment that you awaken in the morning to have a dream journal. Uh, I also suggest that people uh, paint or draw uh, or color their dreams. I'm going to close out with a quote from one of the creatives that I interviewed uh, in the book. And her name is Jody Long. She's an American actress, an Emmy Award winner. I was on Broadway at age seven. She's acted in film, television, and she's also a writer. And this is her quote of what the creative process is. Creativity is not a gift. It's an extension of one's innermost being. And the gift is knowing how to access it, how to allow it to come forth and then giving it to the world. It's getting out of one's head and allowing. It's getting out of one's head and allowing. So this was a very enjoyable and fun. I look forward to doing more with all of you. And I want to thank the Theosophical Society uh, for this introductory talk.